Amen. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning. Another beautiful winter day. And, uh, well, we're not freezing, that's for sure. But uh, makes for a great day. Uh, we're glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us, we're extremely grateful for your presence and look forward to getting to know you better. When you came in, you should have been given a bulletin. Inside that bulletin are upcoming announcements and activities you'll want to be aware of. There are a couple things I do want to draw your attention to. Uh, there is an Annie Armstrong Easter offering envelope in there, as well as a uh, prayer guide. Both of those for the uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering, which is an offering that we support to go to support missions here in North America. And so I would encourage you to please pray about that and pray about what God might have you give to that uh, goal. Our goal as a church, uh, we're trying to raise $3,400 to help in that ministry. And so uh, if you would be willing to help out with that, just uh, place that offering in that Easter offering envelope and we'll uh, get that put where it needs to go. All of that money goes to su specifically support ministries and missionaries here in North America. Uh, I do one, one item that I will add that uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, remind Mary to get in the bulletin. That was my fault. But uh, next week, don't be late because the time changes. All right? So you get one less hour of sleep. No, you don't. Just go to bed an hour earlier. So you can be here and, and be a part of the Sunday school class that you're in. And if you're not, I want to include, encourage you to get involved in one of our Sunday school classes. It's a great time to learn, but it's also a very important time to build relationships and uh, have that connection with other Christians and have that support. So I uh, just wanted to encourage you with that. Um, one other thing, I may mention it at the end, but in case I forget to mention it at the end, uh, on, on two tables out in the foyer are some sheets with uh, codes on them that you can scan uh, for municipal elections in April. This is the deadline this week, is the deadline for, for registering to vote. So if you are not registered to vote, I encourage you to step up and take that responsibility and be a good citizen as well as a good Christian and uh, make sure you're registered to vote. Uh, if you want to check and make sure you are, there's two different codes on there. One of them is so you can register. The other one is to check and make sure you are registered. So uh, whichever one of those applies to you, I encourage you to do that. If, uh, if you have recently moved or gotten married or something, something's changed, you might do well to, to check that out quickly and make sure they've got the right information so you can cast your ballot and be a part of what you're supposed to be a part of as a citizen of the United States of America. All right? Let me open us in a word of prayer as we begin our worship service together. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege of worship and the opportunity just to gather together in your presence and in your name. Lord, we ask right now that you would just help us to, to focus in on, on what this is about because it's all about you, Lord. Turn our eyes completely and totally to you. Open our hearts and minds to what you desire to do here today in each one of our lives. I pray that the distractions of, of our daily life would be set aside right now and that uh, we would allow you to work in our lives. As we lift our voice in song and praise to you, I pray that it would also be an encouragement and a, a time of strengthening in our own walk. But also, Lord, as we enter into your word this morning, may, may your word pierce our hearts. And may we truly grasp what it is that you're desiring us to not only know, but to act on, to do something with. So, Lord, here we are. We have come with great anticipation of what you're going to do here this morning. Receive now the worship of your people and find us faithful in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike? Yeah. Let's we'll stand together as we sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we see holy, holy, holy. We sing holy. Oh. 
be seated. I'm reading this morning from Revelation, sorry, from John, wrong book. John chapter 21, this is when Jesus had died on the cross and he ascended to heaven and he came back and was uh, meeting with the disciples. Uh, They were there, uh, it's the part where Jesus reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. What if Jesus asked you numerous times, do you love me? What would be your answer? I'm sure some days it would be yes, some days, uh, uh, we're probably kind of iffy on that. I think we, we want to be, we want to say yes, and I think we do. But do we always show that in the way we live our life? The next song says, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart. Lord, I want to be more holy. I want to be like Jesus. That's the goal, obviously is to be like Jesus. He set the example for us. Let's sing together the song. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Lord, I 
more. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King. together. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Father, I pray that you would be glorified through all that we do today, Father. Uh, we thank you that you are here in our presence with us, Father. We pray, Father, as we take up our offering, tithes and offerings this morning, Father, it would be uh, just a gift that we're giving back to you, Father, that uh, belong, we know it all belongs to you. We just give back a portion that you've asked us to give. We pray that you would bless it in a mighty way today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
This song is uh, new to us. So I haven't done it in the service here yet. It's kind of a newer song. Um, called Holy Forever. I hope that uh, I invite you to join me in singing if you know it. Uh, if not, I really encourage you to focus on the words today. Uh, great message. Holy Forever. Let's sing together. thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land your name is the high
Father, we are here this morning, Father. We are here to glorify your holy name, Father. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one and only holy God, Father. We pray that our praises are pleasing to you this morning, Father. I just want to say that we do love you, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, as we follow the path of Jesus heading toward the cross, this week we find he and the disciples moving through Jericho to the outer reaches. From the Jordan, the path to Jerusalem takes every traveler through Jericho. And it was in Jericho that Jesus encountered Zacchaeus. While height is what Zacchaeus lacked, today we see Jesus encounter another individual with a greater shortfall. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter 10. We find the disciples concerned about their position in Jesus' reign in chapter 10. But he had a different lesson for them and for us to learn from. Chapter 10 in Mark is is where uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, got a little little bolder with Jesus and had kind of come up to him. Trying, trying to do it secretively so the other disciples wouldn't see. And they came up to Jesus and they said, we want you to do something for us. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, we want one of us to sit at your right hand and one of us to sit at your left when you come into glory. And Jesus said, that's not for me to give. And besides, you don't understand what that even means. And by this time, the other disciples had heard what was going on, and they were rather indignant and a little put out with James and John, and mainly because they didn't think of it first. But uh, Jesus had to explain to them that positions in his kingdom were not about authority and rule. It wasn't like the Gentiles who, who took their positions and lorded it over everyone. And so he said, you just, you just need to watch and listen. And we pick up the situation in verse 46 of chapter 10. As they are passing through Jericho, follow along as I read. It says, then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd... A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped, and he said, Call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up, he is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and he came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Let's consider here what we see in Jesus through this encounter. The first thing I call your attention to is Jesus is on a schedule. Jesus is on a schedule. You'll notice as we began in verse 46, it says, Then they came to Jericho, 
And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, Jesus was on a mission. Jesus was on a schedule. He had intentions. He had plans. He had places to be and things to do. A lot like you and I. We allow our schedules to dictate a lot of our life. But I want you to catch the, the brevity in which Mark describes this. Mark, Mark is a storyteller. He wants, he wants to convey a picture in his, in his story as he tells us about Jesus. And so he's trying to help us to see that there is a plan, there is a schedule, there is a direction that Jesus is going. He had a lot going on, and timing was very important for what he had to do. See, Passover is quickly approaching, and details matter very much. Jesus knew there were things that he was going to have to do in Jerusalem. He needed to be there at a certain time to celebrate Passover. This would be the last time he would celebrate with his disciples. As he knew the cross was coming. So we see that Jesus is on a schedule. We also see in verse 46 and, and through 48 that Jesus' life draws a crowd. It says as he went into Jericho and as they were leaving Jericho, it was he and his disciples along with a crowd. What's so important about the crowd? Well, you and I both know that success tends to draw a crowd. Jesus was having great success. God the Father was working through him. The Spirit was upon him. And, and he was working miracles. He was teaching with authority. And the success that he had was drawing crowds. And he drew crowds wherever he went. If you remember the, the story of Jesus and the disciples crossing over the Sea of Galilee when they, when they landed, the crowds just came. Now remember, this, this wasn't a, a time period like we live in today where uh, commercials on TV and radio and billboards along the highway and everything said, Jesus is going to arrive on such and such a date at such and such a time at such and such a location. Be there. This was all by word of mouth. This was by the moving of the Spirit of God. And so as soon as they had heard that Jesus had landed, people came from everywhere. Everywhere Jesus went, he drew a crowd. Now we should take, let me just give you a little side note, we should take heart with that. Because everywhere Jesus goes, he draws a crowd. What about around us? Are we taking Jesus everywhere we go? Are we allowing people to see Jesus in our lives? If so, the life that we're living and the success that we're having is going to draw crowds. It should. Where things are happening, people congregate. And things happen around Jesus. Things always happen around Jesus. Do you recognize that in your life? Things happen in your life when Jesus is present. The third thing I draw your attention to of, of what we see in Jesus in this passage is that Jesus stopped and listened. He's walking out of Jericho, heading toward Jerusalem, getting ready to, to walk up the path, the path that Jesus used in the parable of the Good Samaritan, heading up toward Jerusalem. Again, he's on a schedule. You don't take that path by night. It's not a good place to be at night. And so we want to make sure we get up the road quick enough. But as he's coming out of, of, of Jericho, oh, and here's, here's this crowd coming behind him. 
he hears someone cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped, and he listened. Last week, we talked about how Jesus stopped and looked up. In both of these situations, someone was in need. Jesus said, call him here. Why? Because it was worth listening to what the man had to say. Because he had a need that Jesus could meet, that the Father could be glorified through. And so here's this whole crowd coming out of Jericho. Odds are... Odds are the gates of Jericho were suddenly jam-packed. Because where, where Bartimaeus would have been is just, just outside the gates of the city, probably sitting in a ditch along the edge of the road, begging, because that's all he could do. He was blind. Someone would lead him out there, or maybe, maybe he had gotten good enough that he could manage to find his way out there on his own and and find a place to sit down right on the edge of the road and beg for people to give him something that he can live off of. So when Jesus gets there and his disciples are just behind him, and then that crowd that is drawn wherever Jesus is, I doubt they all made it out of the city gate before Jesus stopped. Traffic jam probably happened at that moment. Anybody wanting to go in or come out of Jericho was stopped for, for at least a moment. And it appears that not only was there a crowd behind Jesus, but people had heard he was coming. It says Bartimaeus had. And there were people along the road there watching. Why do I say that? Well, because somebody was telling this blind man to be quiet, probably out of respect. This, this great prophet is, is coming by. Don't be yelling at him. Kind of reminds me of that, that uh, commercial for I don't, even, I don't even remember what the commercial is. The, the, the guy who's teaching, teaching people not to become like their parents. <laughs> you know when, when, is it LL Cool J who's standing behind the guy? Now you're going to turn around and you're going to see, whoa, you know. Don't embarrass yourself. Be quiet. That's, that's kind of the picture I get here with those people and, and this blind man. Don't. Don't make a scene. He's an important guy. But he cried out all the more because he had a need. And he had heard about who Jesus was. There was a crowd behind Jesus following him. There was a crowd along the streets, and Jesus stops. He says, what do you want me? Call him here. I want to listen to him. I want to hear what he has to say. So they call him. It says he, he jumps up, and, and it's interesting, just, just little details here. Throwing aside his cloak. What difference does that make? That cloak would have been his protection, his comfort, probably one of the few things that he had of his own. He threw it aside to walk up to Jesus. Ready to engage what Jesus had to offer. And the last thing I draw your attention to of what we see in Jesus through this story is his question. What do you want me to do for you?
Now, I told you a moment ago that a little bit before this, probably before they got into Jericho, uh, they, had, they had stopped to get a little rest before entering into the city, and, and, and James and John had come up to Jesus and, hey, hey, we want you to do something for us. And actually, if you look back a little earlier in chapter 10, you'll find this exact quote from Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? When Jesus asks this question of the blind man, what do you think James and John are thinking? Because Jesus had, had, had used that same question on them. And his answer was no. Yeah, let's, let's watch this guy. Barnabas asks, I want to see. And Jesus heals him. See, James and John were striving for position and power. Bartimaeus starts out drawing attention to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, That meant something. He was speaking of the Messiah. See, Jesus cares. He's interested. And he wants to bless. But as I've told you before, the things that God chooses to do always are done to bring him honor and glory. Not just because you're a good guy or a good gal. Not just because you, you are good and, and God's going to do something for you. See, everything God does is meant to bring him glory and honor, to draw attention to him so others will see him, so others will have the same opportunity of that salvation, of that blessing, of God's intimate relationship with them. He cares. He cares about you. He's interested in you. He wants to bless you. I told you last week this series is really focused on are we willing to be involved? Jesus started ministry with a new covenant. He's not walking the earth today. He's gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, we will one day be. But in the meantime, the ministry that he began when his feet walked this earth, through that dirt road coming out of Jericho, headed to Jerusalem, knowing the cross is ahead, he stopped and he listened to the need of this individual. Are we willing to be involved in this same ministry? A couple of questions for you to consider as we think about that. The first one is this. Will we take time out of our busy schedule? I know. Mine is too. Lots of things on the schedule to do. Lots of things taking up my time. Lots of responsibilities that I have to live up to just like you. Every single one of us, we've got a schedule. Some of, you, some of you are better at scheduling than some of us. 
Some of you have a little day planner where you've got the whole day planned out. You, you set the week out ahead of you. I would, imagine, I would imagine in a group this size, there are some of you out there that probably have this year planned out already. Nothing wrong with that. Knew a gentleman years ago, he, he had decades planned out. Here, here was when he was going to get married, and here was when he was going to buy a house, and here was when he was going to retire, and he, here's, here's the bank account, and here's his goal for how much money he was going to have at this point in time in his life. And most of those he met. He was, he was that rigid in his life. And, and I, I'm not questioning that. I'm not saying good or bad. But we're all busy whether you have a schedule or whether you fly by the seat of your pants, the tendency is we are overscheduled and we are over busy. And in reality, a lot of it, well, it matters some, but it's not as important as oftentimes we put the pressure on us to meet our schedule. To fulfill all of this? Are we willing to take time out of our busy schedule when someone's in need? Second question, will we allow our life to draw a crowd? I don't like a lot of people around me, Pastor. I don't like being in crowds. But Jesus always draws a crowd. And if I have Jesus in my life and I'm living for him, not by my power, but by his power in my life, you know, that's the reality of living for Jesus is that if you choose to do this, if you choose to be faithful and committed to this, then what's going to happen is people are going to see your life. People are going to see the successes in your life. People are going to see how you handle difficulties, how you successfully handle difficulties in your life. They're going to be drawn to that because they want the same thing for themselves. How do you learn to do that? Well, you spend time with people who have. That's what you strive for. Will we allow people to see Jesus? That's, that's how our life draws a crowd. That's how our church should draw a crowd. It isn't whether we've got the, the, the greatest preacher, the greatest musician leading our worship, the greatest youth guy doing, doing youth, the greatest Sunday school teachers in the world, which we have a lot of those things, but it isn't about that. It's whether or not Jesus is being seen. And if Jesus is being seen, a crowd's going to be drawn. Number three. Will we stop and hear those around us? Kind of builds off of the first question, but, but even if we take time out of our busy schedule, a lot of times, and I will confess this is me sometimes as well, a lot of times taking time out of our busy schedule for God means we, we, we stop that busy schedule to come and do some task or things at the church. But do we, will we stop and hear the needs of others? Will we listen to the lives of other people, of what they are needing, and maybe find a way to help? And it all comes down to the last question. Will we care? There's a crowd, and it probably wasn't quiet. As Jesus is leaving Jericho, 
The city gates is where a lot of, of, of deals were made. It's where buying and selling sometimes took place, is at the, the gate of the city. So it was a busy place. In addition to that, he, he's got 12 guys following him who, who, who want their position in his kingdom, and, and they're still trying to get over this thing of, of, what do you mean I have to be the servant of all instead of the, the, the leader of all? I'm, I'm following to be a leader. We all want to be leaders. And, and there's a crowd behind him, and now Jesus has stopped, and so I'm sure there's a little bit of frustration back at the gate of, what's going on? We want to get through. We need to get through. Who stopped the line? Come on, let's get going. And people along the side of the road are, are waving and maybe even shouting, Hosanna. They may, they may have been ahead of themselves a little bit before, before Jesus makes his entry into Jerusalem where they all were shouting, Hosanna. We'll be talking about that, but... Maybe, maybe that's what was going on. And, and as Jesus is walking along, and I'm sure people are trying to talk to him as he's walking as well, one lone voice from the ditch cries out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops for that one voice. He cares enough to stop. He cares enough to listen. He cares enough to let the crowd be there. He cares enough to stop in his busy schedule and take time to find out what this one person needs. It's a ministry that he began that he has left for someone else to do now. The question is who? Who will pick up the ministry? These questions that you have before you. If we will, lives will be changed. And those lives will choose to follow Jesus on the way. See, that's... That's one of the last things I draw your attention to that happens in this story. Jesus' comment. Look at verse 52. Very quickly, look at verse 52. Jesus responds to him after he says, Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. Jesus says, what's, what's the first word that you have that Jesus says there? Go. Now, what does go usually mean? Go is different than come, right? Go, come. We come in here to worship and celebrate God. We go out there to make disciples of all nations. He says, go, your faith has made you well. But then look at that last statement. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him. Now, the New American Standard says, following him on the road. One of your Bibles in here it says it a little bit better for me. It says, and followed him on the way. The way of Jesus. While Jesus said go, Jesus was saying, okay, you, you're healed. You can go back to your family. You can go back to your life. You can, you can uh, make, make a better life now. You can go get a job. You can go take care of your family. You can do so many things that you couldn't do before, so many things that you have wanted to do all of your life. You can go and do now because you are healed. Bartimaeus did not go back and get his cloak that piece of comfort, that piece of security that he left laying in the ditch when he ran to Jesus. It says immediately he followed Jesus on the way. 
That's what our lives can do for others, is help them to find the way. The way of Jesus that gives you courage to live life to the fullest, that walks by your side to help you out when you're in need, that surrounds you with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who will be there to support and encourage you, to pick you up when you are in the ditch, to walk by your side when you're going through difficult times, to rejoice with you when things are going well. You see, the way of Jesus is what everybody's really looking for, whether they realize it or not. When Bartimaeus' eyes are opened, he sees a brand new world. Yet there's only one focus, Jesus. And he follows him on the way. I wonder, the last question for you to consider this morning, are we encouraging eyes to see? What Jesus did for Bartimaeus, wasn't all about being able to see God's beautiful creation all around him, to see his family. It was about seeing who Jesus was, of gaining that vision. And he did. And he chose to follow him on the way. Are we encouraging eyes to see with our lives, with our church, with what we say, with what we do? So far we've seen Jesus stop and look up, and we've seen Jesus stop and listen. There's a couple of simple things that you and I can do as well. The question is, will we? Will we choose to follow him on the way like Bartimaeus did? Where are you going? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, the intensity of, of considering that Jesus is knowing exactly what is coming. He's facing the cross, the greatest price paid for anyone. And yet he sets in place a ministry for us to carry on if we will be faithful. A ministry to follow in his footsteps, to pick up what he started, to care. The evidence of Jesus has always been the same. When, when John sent his disciples to Jesus while he was in prison, and he, and he sent his disciples who had been following him in, in, in the way of the baptism and repentance, he, he sent his followers to Jesus and, and said, go ask him if he is the one. Jesus' answer was, go tell John what you have seen the blind eyes see and the deaf hear and the prisoners are set free. The evidence of Jesus has always been the same and it remains so today in our lives. We need to be intentional about it. We need to care. We need to stop 
and look up and listen. We need to help. Eyes to see who Jesus is in our lives. Father God, I pray your spirit would move mightily right now in this place. I pray, Lord, that if there be any here in the sound of my voice or even watching from home, right now that your spirit would move mightily through each and every one of us, that we would be honest and admit, do we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Have we received that free gift of grace that was given on the cross and made it our own? Or are we just holding on to some knowledge and wondering what we should do with it? Lord, today can be a day of salvation if your spirit will move mightily in their lives right now. That they would choose in this moment to surrender to you and cry out. Admit that they are a sinner because we all are. And recognize that there is a penalty for that sin, which is eternal separation from you. But that you have provided the way. You have provided the price so we don't have to. We can be bought with a price. The payment has been made on our behalf if we will receive it. And I pray that they would today, any who do not know that, that they would cry out to you and ask you to forgive their sin, to come into their life and be their Lord and Savior this morning. Lord, for many of us here, we have made that cry of salvation and we have experienced it. But have we truly picked up the ministry that you have left for us to fulfill in our daily lives, where we're at, in the jobs that we have, in the homes and neighborhoods that we're in, in the families that you placed us? Are we living in such a way that others see Jesus in us and are drawn to you? Help us this morning, each one of us, to be more intentional about that. That we might show that, yes, we are willing to be involved. Lord, right now, bless the decisions that are made here. You desire so much to bless. May you have the opportunity to do so now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. This is a time for you to choose what you're going to do with what you've heard. If you want to know more about asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, or maybe you just uttered that prayer right where you were seated and ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, we would love to celebrate that with you. And we would love to help you in this new walk. Or if you have questions about doing that, we would love to answer any questions we, we can. For many of us, I hope that you will consider the, the question of your willingness to be involved. Will you choose to be more intentional and pick up the ministry that he's left for us? Maybe you just need to come and spend a moment in prayer at the altar. A couple of our deacons will be here at the front. You can grab one of them. They would be happy to pray with you. Or if you've got questions about joining this church, about, about following in believer's baptism, or about receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are here for that purpose. God is at work. Will you let him work through you this morning? As we sing this hymn of invitation, will you respond to what God is saying to you and take action right now? So are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free.
couple of reminders for us. Uh, today at four o'clock, we'll have a deacons meeting. And then tomorrow at seven o'clock, we will have the MLT meeting. Um, Renewed Women's Ministry will meet this Tuesday uh, at 6.30. They'll be filling eggs for the upcoming Easter egg hunt. Uh, so please bring candy for the eggs and snacks will be provided for that. And then this Thursday at 11, the Fellowship of the Saints will head to Joy Walk in Liberty. And so, is that, a, is, that a, uh, is that a Christian joy? <laughs> Walk. Walk in joy. That's what we're called to do. Okay, sorry. Couldn't resist. All right. Well, Earl is going to come and close us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing a chorus to finish our worship time together. Bow with me in prayer. Father, it's always great to be in your house, Lord. Lord, uh, we've heard your message today, and Lord, I pray that you'll just help us to have the faith as this one along the side of the road, that your mercy is all giving, Lord, you are all powerful, that you could even restore our sight if need be. Let, help us to have that kind of faith, Lord, that when we do receive your gifts, we know how to come and go and spread your good news. Be with us as we go out this day, Lord. Give us safe travels. Help us to be a good witness for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. I love you. Have a great week.